India is like nowhere else on earth thrilling, frustrating, inspiring, and most of all, incredibly diverse. With around 750 different languages in daily use, the sheer profusion of its peoples and landscapes is unparalleled. India's long history of accepting and absorbing newcomers and of changing over time to express their ideas is reflected in its open-minded and welcoming attitude and fascinating range of cultures and beliefs. With landscapes that vary from the world's highest mountain ranges to tropical beaches, India has an almost endless variety of peoples and places to explore. The sights and sounds of this enormous country have a spellbinding effect and live long in the memory. Despite the advances brought by 21st century globalization, with rising prosperity, high-tech industries and burgeoning car ownership, India largely retains its mesmeric otherness, a kind of old-fashioned handmade, homespun quality that sets it apart from everywhere else. There is evidence from the earliest times of great movements of peoples across South Asia, sometimes replacing existing populations, sometimes integrating with them. They came from West and Central Asia in massive sweeps through the lofty passes in the Northwest, bringing with them the rudiments of the Hindu faith, later to be developed on Indian soil into a subtle and highly complex religion. Other religions such as Buddhism, Islam, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism have developed and been absorbed into India's proverbial sponge. With these peoples and religions have come a variety of ethnicities, art, architecture, culture, philosophy, science, and technology that have all influenced India's intricate mosaic. With over 1.3 billion people around 17% of the world's total and a hugely diverse range of cultures, languages, and belief systems. India's greatest resource is the number and variety of its people, but the social order is hugely intricate. With myriad religious traditions and institutions, such as the caste system spinning a formidable web for the outsider to untangle. Traditionally, the overarching form of social organization in South Asia is the caste system. While this is now complicated by the emerging issue of class, caste is still the primary way in which people identify and group themselves. The concept has proved so enduring that even religious communities that are theoretically outside the system have retained caste structures. In the case of Muslim, Sikh, and Christian groups, this is often a hangover from their families' pre-conversion days. There are a vast number of castes, most relating to a traditional profession, although the structure is more flexible than it might at first appear. New castes can sometimes be created to accommodate new arrivals, and castes can reposition themselves within the overall structure, usually by adopting names associated with higher castes or achieving hegemony in certain economic activities, thereby gaining more power and status. Such adjustments take time, however, and it is far more difficult for those at the bottom or the Dalits who are positioned below the lowest stratum of the system to improve their lot, even if they convert away from Hinduism. India's caste system is based on the twin concepts of Dharma and Karma. The duties one must fulfill in this life and the effects one's actions will have on any future lives. These, coupled with the principle of hereditary occupation and strong concepts of pollution, have produced a highly stratified society, which, due to its flexibility, is one that can absorb new peoples without much difficulty. The laws of Manu spell out codes for life in a multiracial society. Each individual is born into a particular caste that predetermines both profession and status, regardless of the wealth of the parents. These castes are said to fall into four basic divisions, the Brahmins are intellectuals and priests, the link between mortals and millions of Hindu deities. Kshatriyas are rulers and warriors in charge of justice and administration. Both Brahmins and Kshatriyas are considered twice born and display their status with a sacred thread worn over the shoulder. Below them are the Vaishyas, merchants or traders, and the Shudras, agriculturalists. However, the most menial tasks are reserved for the outcasts, in practice, the peoples conquered by higher castes and considered unworthy to be part of the system. Their jobs include cleaning latrines, sweeping the streets, scavenging, burning corpses, and gathering dead animals, which extends to working with leather, making shoes, and playing drums at funerals or weddings. In the social division imposed by the laws of Manu, there was an implicit racism based on skin color. Within the new hierarchy, the lighter-skinned arrivals from the Northwest were at the top of the heap, with the darker Dravidian and indigenous peoples pushed to the bottom and into menial positions, a distinction that exists to this day.
The concept of caste has a great impact on the life cycle rituals of birth, coming of age, marriage, and death. Midwives have traditionally been from the low castes, as blood and afterbirth are seen as polluting. In the past, and even now among some very strict adherents to the caste system, if a high caste person was to come into physical contact with an item or person who was considered polluting, then they would have to go through elaborate rituals of cleansing and purification. On coming of age, high caste males go through a ritual whereby they receive their sacred thread, a string worn across the body over one shoulder that is a marker of their high caste status. This practice has now been adopted by some lower castes in an attempt to raise their status and profile. Marriage is traditionally the most important event in anyone's life in India. Fraught with complications, from caste and the negotiation of a dowry, the vast majority of marriages in India are still arranged by the couple's parents. In the past, a marriage broker would have been employed to find a suitable match for a son or daughter. But now newspapers are full of matrimonials, and the internet has greatly expanded the family's potential for finding a spouse. For high caste matches, the requests are often very specific, demanding and tinged with an underlying racism. Women are advertised as having weedish complexions, and there are requests for green cards, higher degrees, and high potential earning power. Nowadays, these kinds of ruthless demands are not only restricted to the upper castes as a pan-Indian Sanskritization encourages the low castes to ape the behavior of those more rich and powerful. Extended family life in a densely populated country can be fraught with problems of privacy. Most societies in India are patriarchal, and a daughter must leave her parents to set up a household with the groom's family. There are a bewildering number of terms for family relationships. It can sometimes seem that everyone in a room is distantly related in some fashion. Bahu, the daughter-in-law, and Sas, the mother-in-law, are notorious adversaries in the Indian family and a focus for conflicts over duty, obedience, and respect. Brother, Bai, and older sister, Didi, are affectionate and respectful terms of address, even for people outside the nuclear family. It is common to call a visitor auntie or uncle, and older people may call you son, beta, or daughter, Betty. Mata and Pita are terms for mother and father, and there are many other names for relatives that indicate the birth order and branch of the family. In many ways, India's multiplicity of peoples and forms of social organization are best seen through the prism of its numerous religions. These are not only the repository of many of its subtle philosophical traditions, but have also proved flexible enough to absorb influences from newly arrived traditions, such as Islam and Christianity, which is the third most followed religion in India today, with nearly 28 million adherents, as well as influencing the new arrivals in turn. While, in general, the interaction between different religious groups has been positive, at times there has also been considerable friction. Here is no one set of beliefs that might sum up India's dominant belief system, Hinduism. No other religious tradition or group of devotees is so eclectic. It is not traced to a specific founder and does not have a single holy book as its scriptural authority. There are a plethora of deities, some only local, that can be worshipped through a tradition of direct devotion or by elaborate temple rituals. The land and landscape of India is intimately entwined with Hindu beliefs. From holy rivers such as the Ganges to Mount Kailash in Tibet, the holy mountain of Shiva, and sacred groves of trees. Hinduism thrives on contrasts. At one end is the most abstruse metaphysical speculation about ultimate reality. At the other, there are popular practices based on the worship of local deities. Absolute monism goes hand in hand with extreme pluralism. On the one side, Hinduism accepts the validity of many paths leading to the same goal and is willing to recognize the divinity of the prophets of other religions. But along with this tolerance at present under threat, go rigid adherence to caste distinctions and custom-ridden practices. Defying attempts to define it, this multiplicity is perhaps Hinduism's most defining characteristic. Not only Hinduism, but there are also many other religions in India, such as Islam, Buddhism, Sikhism, and Jainism, among others. It's not possible to cover all of them in a single video. If you want to learn more about these religions or anything else related to India, please let us know. We will continue discussing India in the next episode.